problems are just opportunities in work clothes. It has become clear that America has lost the capacity to produce the machines, medicine, and goods that we need to thrive. Decades of globalization hollowed out the country and left the United States reliant on China for medical equipment, reliant on Europe for pharmaceuticals, reliant on Taiwan for semiconductors. What we desperately need are builders, entrepreneurs that aren't just pushing code, but can push atoms through the physical world. Venture capitalist Mark Andreessen summarized it. In fact, I think building is how we reboot the American dream. The things we build in huge quantities, like computers and TVs, drop rapidly in price. The things we don't, like housing, schools, and hospitals, skyrocket in price. What's the American dream? The opportunity to have a home of your own and a family you can provide for. We need to break the rapidly escalating price curves for housing, education, and healthcare to make sure that every American can realize the dream. And the only way to do that is to build. We need infrastructure. We need radically different healthcare. We need to manufacture our key goods locally. And we need builders like Henry J. Kaiser. Kaiser built battleships for World War II, competed directly with U.S. Steel, and founded one of the country's largest healthcare organizations, Kaiser Permanente. And as if that wasn't enough, his construction company helped build the Hoover Dam. Kaiser didn't stay in a single niche. He would have been turned off by the minimalists. He was an entrepreneurial maximalist. The greatest entrepreneurs are like ancient conquerors, marching from industry to industry, slaying enemies and taking market share. Similarly, Kaiser's story is one of relentless pursuit, patient opportunism and common sense strategy. Exactly what our country needs more of. So buckle up and prepare to learn about one of history's finest industrialists. In his heyday, Henry Kaiser was as famous as Warren Buffett or Elon Musk. But he was not born into wealth. He was the child of German immigrants. And his father, Frank, was a shoemaker who made every product by hand and delivered them to customers himself. Frank's competitors built factories and used delivery networks and promptly outpaced his old fashioned approach. Young Henry saw his father's inefficiency and the financial hardship that it created for their family. As a young man, he vowed to not repeat the same mistake. Wasting no time, Henry started working in his early teens and earned a role as a traveling salesman by the age of 16. By his mid twenties, Kaiser was an adept, relentless salesperson, and that skill would serve him for the rest of his career. In 1914, the same year World War I began, Kaiser entered the construction industry as a paving contractor. For the next 18 years, he spent most of his time building roads. He earned a reputation for completing jobs with remarkable speed. He mastered coordinating workers and materials, adopting new technologies like the Caterpillar tractor, and forging relationships with other businesses. Later, he'd say those 18 years were the bedrock of his maturation as a businessman. By 1920, road building opportunities were basically unlimited. The explosion in popularity of Henry Ford's Model T created an insatiable appetite for the open road. Governments ramped up funding to meet the demand, and they hired Henry Kaiser. All was well until the Great Depression struck in 1929, and construction firms were hit first. To save his company, Kaiser decided that he needed to get a government contract to build the Hoover Dam. The New Deal passed through Congress and contractors had just a few months to submit their bids for the location of the new dam. So every day after work, Kaiser would jump in his car, speed to the prospective job site and ferociously study the terrain. By the time bids were due, no one on earth knew more about how to build the Hoover Dam than Henry Kaiser. And the contract that saved his company also represented the beginning of Kaiser's relationship with his largest customer, the U.S. government. Today in 2023, 45% of global shipbuilding happens in China. 
the U.S. does one-tenth of one percent. If their navies were to go to war, who would be able to replenish their fleet faster? During World War II, the British had similar issues. UK boats were being sunk by German submarines three times faster than they were being built. The UK government had enormous contracts and cash ready to give anyone that could build enough ships. Enter Kaiser Shipbuilding. Despite not knowing much about ships, Henry attacked the problem with boundless energy and first principles thinking. To start, Kaiser refused to build his ships up from the ground in one large hull. Despite that being customary for most shipbuilders, Kaiser knew he could be more efficient by using an assembly line similar to how Henry Ford produced his automobiles. Once large pieces had been prefabricated, Kaiser's team used their skills with heavy cranes that they'd learned in construction to lift each piece into place. This is similar to how Elon Musk innovated rocket manufacturing. At SpaceX, they manufacture their rockets horizontally, while traditionally firms have assembled rockets vertically. Kaiser also tapped into a larger labor pool. You've probably seen Rosie the Riveter. While she was a great piece of propaganda, most of the unskilled labor entering the workforce, remember these are housewives called into duty, were not sophisticated enough to fasten metal together. Riveting ain't easy. However, they could be taught to weld, and that's exactly what Kaiser had them do. Kaiser's Liberty ships and Victory ships were welded together at such an unprecedented pace that they broke records. The Richmond Shipyard No. 2 built the Liberty ship SS Robert E. Perry in just four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes, a record that still stands to this day. In testimony at a 1942 Senate committee meeting, future President Harry S. Truman asked Kaiser if he had been involved in shipbuilding before 1940. He answered, no, I had never seen a ship launched. Kaiser Shipbuilding eventually grew to over 200,000 employees. They turned out 15 million deadweight tons of shipping at a cost of $4 billion in the 1940s. Kaiser built ships so fast that he started to run out of steel. You heard that correctly. He built ships faster than steel was being produced. So he established Kaiser Steel to ensure the reliable supply of this key alloy. During the war effort, the U.S. government opened funding for the construction of multiple new state-of-the-art steel plants. Since Kaiser was a trusted industrialist with D.C. connections and a strong reputation for execution, he got the deal for a steel plant in Fontana, California. The plant's first blast furnace, Best No. 1, named after Kaiser's wife, was fired up on December 30th, 1942 and the Fontana facility went on to produce 75 million tons of steel over its history. The company expanded rapidly and became the largest steel producer on America's West Coast. And the vertical integration of Kaiser's business empire was just unbelievable. Here's how it worked. Iron ore was supplied by Kaiser's mine in Eagle Mountain, California. Using Kaiser's Eagle Mountain Railroad, Coal was supplied by Kaiser's Mine in New Mexico and Utah. Limestone was from a Kaiser Mine in Cushenberry, California, and the steel made its way to Kaiser Shipyards and other Kaiser-owned businesses. And all the workers received healthcare through Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente was initially established to provide medical care to construction workers on job sites. Think about a project like the Hoover Dam. Thousands of men doing dangerous work in brutal conditions far from any population center. Kaiser wanted to take care of his people, so he set up a program to take a small amount from each worker's pay to keep a small hospital staffed with a doctor on site. Before he did this, there just wouldn't be a doctor on location. 95% of his employees signed up. In partnership with Dr. Sidney Garfield, Kaiser founded the first nonprofit health maintenance organization in the United States. Its brilliance is in aligned incentives. To a private doctor, a sick person is an asset. 
To Kaiser Permanente, a sick person is a liability. This meant preventative care and regular checkups. Despite the enormous industrial projects that he completed, by the end of his life, Kaiser would often predict that his health maintenance organization would end up having the largest impact. And he was right. At Kaiser's death in 1967, the health plan covered 1.6 million participants. In the next 20 years, membership more than tripled. Today, Kaiser Permanente is one of the largest healthcare providers in the United States. Over his career, Kaiser started more than 100 companies, employed hundreds of thousands of employees, and impacted tens of millions of lives. He was an entrepreneurial maximalist. I hope his story and this video inspired you. Now go build something.